I'd like to welcome you to the first of the Ohio at Home series, where we'll be speaking with Dr. Glenn Detcher, a behavioral economist in the economics department in the College of Arts and Sciences at Ohio University. Dr. Dutcher has done some incredibly interesting research surrounding the pandemic, and we're going to discuss how he has shifted his focus to take every opportunity to study this unprecedented time that we're living in, and how we are all reacting to it as people and humans and dealing with this every day. So Dr. Dutcher, um, can you introduce yourself and give us a little bit of background on yourself and your work, please? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, thanks for having thanks for having me. It's a uh, it's a fun opportunity. Um, these kinds of <laughs> nice little chats. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm an I'm an economist. This is my sixth year at Ohio University, um, and I'm 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 traditionally viewed as a behavioral economist. Um, so behavioral economists, what we really do is we try and think about combining insights from a lot of different areas uh, into economics analysis. So most of the time, it's going to come from psychology. The very first two papers that I worked on in grad school, for instance, one of them was dealing with the evolution of fairness, the norm of fairness, the perceptions of fairness. How does fairness evolve? What does fairness mean? Um, which normally we wouldn't think is a very is a is a is a is a um, economics concept. Um, but if you look at a lot of bargaining situations, for instance, what price are we going to end up with a house? What price are we going to end up with a car? How are labor unions going to negotiate some kind of contract with the owners of a firm? Um, fairness comes into play in a lot of economic scenarios, and so we need to understand that. Um, and then the other, so that would be sort of the odd one, right? Economists don't study fairness. But the other one that I did, which, which you would say, well, yeah, economists probably does that, is I looked at um, productivity of workers, and specifically I wanted to understand the productivity of telecommuters. Um, and you'd say, yeah, that's a really normal thing. That's what I think economists should be doing. But even there, I, was, I, I went a little bit outside of the mold, and I said, okay, yeah, let's say the productivity of workers, but I really want to understand a little bit more about the productivity dependent upon the types of tasks. And so I introduced these, these ideas of, of creativity and, and, and does, does creativity um, sort of, is, 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 is that somehow different? Do workers respond differently in these kinds of creative tasks? So even in that sort of normal thing, I was a bit of an oddball out, outside of there um, in studying something that people don't normally think economists would study. Great, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for joining us today. We're excited about this conversation. I know that I've been fascinated by our previous conversations about your work and I can't wait to share more with our audience about your department and what you're all doing. Um, so to get started, I'd like to talk a little bit about how your research has looked at the pandemic in association with political views. I thought this would be an interesting topic since we're coming up on the election. So if you can tell us a little bit about your research and what you have found about how Democrats and Republicans differ in their response to the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, a, a, a key component of economics is really how people gather and use information. Um, I mean, we're really interested in that. I mean, I mean, because the information that people receive is essentially what they're going to use to make their choices. And the canonical example that we often use in, in, in sort of our classes is, is the stock market, right? Um, what do we think drives prices within the stock market? Well, we think that probably information does. If, if, you, if you see um, that some company might be tanking, then, oh, you're going to, you're going <laughs> to, whatever, whatever kind of information you have about that, you're going to go in and you're going to short sell that stock or you're going to, or you're going to sell it, right? And the price of that stock is going to tank. Um, but even though that's a pretty easy example, we think that it's in general indicative of how people behave. That is the, um, what kind of information they receive and how they use that kind of information um, might affect might affect their behavior, um, and so what we were interested in understanding was if the information or the or or how people viewed different sources of information might differ by the political party, and then if that would then drive differences in how they were re responding to the COVID pandemic, and the response would be something like I'm gonna I'm gonna wear a face mask, I'm not gonna wear a face mask, I'm gonna wash my hands, I'm not gonna wash my hands. I'm going to wash my groceries or, or these things like this. So we were washing our groceries at, at first, too. Um, then they said it's, we didn't have to anymore. <laughs> but um, um, that's really what we were trying to understand. And there's a lot of evidence that suggests that, um, that, that this political divide really does differ in how we, first of all, what kind of information we receive. And so, right, if, if we think, you know, in, in, in the very abstract world, maybe um, Republicans are only ever watching Fox News. I mean, that's not true, of course. Or Democrats are only ever watching MSNBC. 
And if, if you looked at the content, and, and we did, if, we, if you looked at the content that's being displayed on sort of those two channels, um, there's different information that's being given to, um, to the viewers on these two channels. Um, and, and, and at the same time, if you ask individuals sort of, you know, do you trust? So if you ask sort of a Democrat, do you trust content that's coming out of Fox News? The answer is usually no. And if you ask a Republican, do you trust the content that, that's coming out of MSNBC? The answer is usually no. And so if we have this, these differences in the perception of sort of, of what we think about information and how we view that kind of information, we thought that might, that might potentially drive a difference. And of course, the policy relevance here is, well, what can we do to correct these kinds of information asymmetries? In or if, if we think that there is some sort of policy um, 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 guidance that's coming from scientists, then how can we think about a, a correction here? And so that was our goal. Our goal was to say, can we, can we look at how these biases or how these different kinds of information sources might lead to differences in behavior in terms of, of what people are doing to avoid um, um, getting exposure? Um, so that was the goal. <laughs> so what we wanted to do is we designed the survey. And whenever we were designing the survey, we are super, super picky <laughs> in how we're putting this thing together. Um, and, and there's sort of an art, um, there's sort of a science and an art of how, how, how you can put these surveys together. And one thing that we wanted to avoid um, were these kinds of potential biases that, that, that might occur. Um, from from whatever what, whatever we've sort of seen from <laughs> some other potentially bad survey de designs, um, um, and specifically, we thought that a lot of answers on surveys in in the past were due to expressive reasons. That is, people were giving they were they were answering the survey just simply to an express and simply to express an opinion, and it was maybe misaligned with what their actual behavior was. So, how can we think about why that might be expressive? Well, if you ask somebody some very politically charged question, right before you ask them, are you more or less likely to wear a face mask? Are you more or less likely to wash your hands? So if you ask them that politically charged question, right before you ask them the question on their behavior, maybe they're still in that mindset. Maybe they want to answer that question in that same politically charged way. And so it wasn't our intention. Um, to sort of show that that was potentially what was going on in a lot of these surveys, we were just trying to do a very careful job of survey design. Um, and so in our questions, you know, the first thing that we're asking them is, what is your behavior? How are you, you know, what are you doing on a daily basis? Um, and then afterwards, you ask them, you know, you know, what do you think about different policies from Democrats, different policies from Republicans or whatever. But the core result that we found is we didn't even have to get into the media bias stuff. To, to understand if, 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 if everybody was different. The core result that we found was that, that Republicans and Democrats were exactly the same. We were finding no differences in how they were responding to washing their hands, wearing a face mask, social distancing, not, not attending concerts, all of these kinds that we, we, that we, that we think <laughs> could drive behavior. And we thought, well, that's, that's bonkers. Why are we getting this result? It doesn't make any sense. And so we designed a second wave of this survey to take advantage of when, whenever wearing a face mask was so politicized. So we, we designed a second survey and, and, and we, we pumped out this survey at that moment whenever it, was at its, whenever it was at its height, whenever there was really supposedly a strong divide between Republicans and Democrats. Um, and so a couple of things that we did in that second survey, the first one is, is that, we, that we, we, we asked the exact same questions that some news organizations were asking about face mask wearing. We wanted to make sure that we're asking it in the same way that everybody else is. Um, but then the second thing is um, that, that we wanted to do is we wanted to include some additional questions which we thought might be important. And one of those is, you know, somebody's views on conspiracy theories, um, because we thought, well, maybe that's driving something. I mean, it's, it's before that was. Um, so again, in that second way, we found no difference in Republicans or Democrats. Washing hands, face mask wearing, nothing. There was no difference. And we have this representative population of, I don't know, I think the second wave was something like 600 people from all across the U.S., all demographic groups, all income ranges. And so we, we have a pretty good representative sample. Um, so the only thing that we were picking up on was, was, was that, was if people are, are more likely to believe in conspiracy theories, they're less likely to wear a face mask, they're less likely to do these things. But there was no difference. What we found was there's no difference in the way that Democrats and, and, and Republicans were responding. That's so interesting, especially in a, 
coming up on an election that's as charged as this one, you know, it's really interesting to hear that when it comes down to it, yes, we definitely have differing beliefs between Democrats and Republicans, but in terms of our motivations, we're all motivated to stay safe and protect each other. And that sort of comes to be our core belief. So um, I think that's so interesting and I appreciate your insight on that. Another topic that I wanted to talk about, um, you and I had previously discussed the concept of motivated beliefs and I was just fascinated by this and what this means and what it means for us in the pandemic. So can you define for us the concept of motivated beliefs, what's that mean? And then how do they present themselves during the pandemic and how are we dealing with them? Yeah, yeah, sure. So. Um, motivated beliefs is kind of a new concept within economics, and again, we're we're pulling we're pulling a lot of these things from from psychology, and so we're we're trying to incorporate these psychological concepts into into our economic models. Um, so the idea of of motivated beliefs is that if there's a reason for an individual to hold a different belief than than what actually could be um, true in reality, then they might do so. Okay, so so here's here's the fun example that um, I like to give like right for my class um, whenever I'm talking about motivated beliefs. Um, okay, so let's pause for a minute. Let's 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 think for just a moment. How many of us believe that we're above average drivers? So thinking about our driving skills, how many of us are above average drivers? I think I'm the best driver there is. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my wife, and I do too. <laughs> Yeah, so so in 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 you know some of the initial studies, there was one that was done you know long long time ago, uh, 1981. That's a long long time ago. Um, it, it's not that long ago anymore. <laughs> but my kids, the kids in my class, think that that's a long time ago. Um, so what this study looked at was um, they they asked people that exact question. You know, um, how many of you in the survey? How many of you think that your driving skills are a above 50% of, of those other kinds of drivers. And so, right, above the median. So how many people are above the median? And in that, in that initial survey, 93% of them said they thought that they were above the median. Well, I mean, it, it obviously, like mathematically, that just simply doesn't work. It's not possible that 93% of the people are, are, are in the upper 50th percentile. It, 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 it just is impossible. Um, and, and so, and so these, these, these kinds of questions have been repeated again and again, and the same survey results usually come out, that people have somehow this, um, this, this potential in, in inflated view of themselves. Um, there was another study that looked at um, students at Stanford, and so students at Stanford, it was a Stanford study, and so the students at Stanford that were, I think, in, the, in, in an MBA program, how many of them thought that they were above the median student in, in terms of whatever, whatever metric they wanted to think about? And it was something like, <coughs> sorry, 85% of, uh, of the students thought they were better than the median student um, in, in their class. And again, that obviously can't be true. And so the question that's sort of facing economists then is, is why? Why do we think that people are, are, are acting this way? And, and not only why do we think they're answering these surveys in this way, but do we think that the, the way that they're forming these beliefs has an impact on their actual choices? Okay, so, so if we step back, I mean, what are the sort of different components here? I mean, first of all, there has to be some outcome which is a little bit uncertain. Right? There is something in the future that I may not know. Right, I don't know if I'm above average driver. I don't know if my driving skills are actually, I probably think that I'm above average, but maybe I don't actually know. And so I have to form some belief about that thing. Um, I have to form, you know, what, you know, what does that mean? And so, um, so as I'm forming a belief about that thing, so how are these beliefs formed? I mean, these beliefs are formed by a lot of different pieces of information that I'm receiving along the way. So what might I use? So if I'm, so let's say I haven't gotten into an accident in the last 15 years. Well, maybe I'm going to say, well, that's a pretty good indication that I'm a good driver if I haven't gotten into an accident. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to receive a bunch of signals about whatever that belief is. And, and maybe, just maybe, I want to hold the belief that I am better than average. Why? I don't know. It makes me feel good, right? If it makes me feel good to think that I'm, I'm better than average, then maybe I'm going to put a lot more weight onto those signals that I receive that sort of reinforce that good view that I have of myself. And maybe I ignore those signals that sort of reinforce 
or or it would tell me that maybe I'm not a good driver, right? Uh, maybe I maybe I get a speeding ticket and I say, well, you know what? That doesn't mean I'm a bad driver. Everybody gets speeding tickets, so it's fine. It's it it doesn't mean I'm bad. I still am. I'm, I still haven't gotten into in any accidents, and so and so. I still want to believe that I'm a good driver, and so in general, we we have this general we have this sort of general class of 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 of, of reasons why we think people might hold these kinds of beliefs um, that are different based on the signals that they were receiving. Um, so you can think, for instance, uh, maybe I want to think that I'm just better. Why? Because it allows me to tackle some really difficult tasks. So, for instance, maybe. Me going into grad school, I thought I'm getting into grad school. I'm I'm going to do my PhD. I'm prob I must be pretty good at it, right? And so I'm going to do it, right? And and so um, I I must be pretty good. So my expectation is I'm going to enter grad school. I'm going to finish. If I didn't think I was this good, if I thought I might fail out, um, then I'm not going to enter into grad school anymore. So maybe what I need to do is maybe I had I need to sort of misconstrue some signals and believe in myself a little bit more than what I actually am. So that I can engage in this very difficult endeavor, um, and then in the end, I mean, I didn't fail out, so I made it through grad school. But in the end, I was probably a little bit overconfident, right? Probably um, I wasn't as good as I thought I was whenever I whenever I started going into it. Um, there's also these these other kinds of reasons for, for motivated beliefs. I mean, it also could be the case that you need to believe that you're a better than average or that you're really really good. Um, so that you can get others to follow you. So this is often the case with leaders. So a leader might have some sort of inflated view of what their abilities are because they need other people to follow them. And if other people follow them, then they can accomplish some other kinds of goal that's important to whatever their task is, the organization or, 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 or whatever it might be. And so we can think that there's a lot of reasons why I might want to have some biased view of, of, of these things. And, and that's a, mo a motivated reason to hold a different kind of belief. And so what we wanted to think about in this case, um, you know, thinking about um, uh, applying this, this kind of a concept to COVID is we wanted to think about um, sort of the situation that a lot of people were in. And we thought, I mean, I mean, I mean unfortunately, right, there's a lot of people that um, whenever our survey was conducted, especially, that have lost their job because of COVID. And we thought, well, that's, you know, that's not, <laughs> that's, that's a really hard thing for them to, to go through. And so in our survey, we, you know, one of the questions was, did you lose your job because of COVID? And, um, and so what is, what does this imply then? And, and how can I sort of tie that to a motivated belief? Well, if I lost my job because of COVID, what do I want? What I want if I lost my job is I want to, I want to get a job. I don't want to be unemployed. I want to get a, another job. Um, so, um, what in my belief structure might enable me to get a to to sort of get a job again? Well, maybe it's the case that I lost my job because of COVID. So, if I had a belief that COVID isn't as dangerous as it actually was, if I had this belief, um, maybe right, if if that were actually true, if COVID actually weren't that dangerous then we could, our economy could be restarted again and I would have a chance to get a job again. And so that's specifically, so there's, there's sort of a channel here that, that there, is, there is some unknown outcome. We don't actually know, we have some idea about how dangerous COVID is, but we don't actually know how dangerous COVID is. And so it allows us to form a belief about this thing. And so, and so after we, you know, we asked them, you know, um, um, did you lose your job because of COVID? Um, and then thereafter, we asked them, well, how dangerous do you think COVID is? And um, in this case, we found that the people who had lost their job um, stated their beliefs of the dangers of COVID to be lower than those people who still had their job. Um, and then thereafter, of course, we had all of those other questions. Are you more like, you know, are you wearing a face mask? Are you washing your hands? Are you doing, but th those were our first questions, right? So that can't be influenced by, you know, these other kinds of things. So we were careful. <laughs> and and so what we found was that um, the, these kinds of motivated reasons or these kinds of motivated beliefs actually played a role. Those people who stated that they lost their job because of COVID were less likely to wash their hands, were less likely to wear face masks, were less likely to engage in social distancing and all of these things. And so we found that that even in this kind of a setting, there seems to be some, some actual relevance to this kind of core idea of motivated beliefs.
That's interesting. I actually kind of wonder, that was making me think about how um, when Ohio University, along with the rest of the world, sent everyone to having to work from home, I remember thinking, uh, I'm concerned. If we're in a situation where we're all working from home, this must be really serious. And I remember my father is an essential employee, so he, he nothing ever changed for him. And my mom is retired, so their their world didn't shift at all when this happened. And so my dad was just sort of of the mindset, nothing's wrong, nothing. It's not that serious. Everyone's overreacting. And I kind of wonder if there's a motivation to that too, that his world hasn't changed. So he that kind of sets up his belief system around how, how, how different it is or how bad it is, whereas mine changed dramatically. And so maybe that affects how I think about it. So I, I just think that's an interesting concept. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean what's, what is really cool about all of this stuff is, is, is how people receive information and how they update their beliefs. And I, I think, I mean, I mean, not directly related to the motivated beliefs, but I think what you're talking about is exactly why we're potentially seeing some kind of increases in, in, in the pandemic or increases in the infection rate, which is, you know, maybe, maybe I do a thing and it turns out that it's not so dangerous, right? Let's say that I buy groceries or let's say that I go to the grocery store. So, so what I'm, that's a signal that I'm receiving about the dangers of COVID. I go to the grocery store, I buy groceries and I don't get sick. And I think, okay, well, that was, that was safe. Okay, can I do something else? I'm gonna be safe. Maybe I'll go to a restaurant. I'll sit outside and I'll wear my mask and everything. But I go to the restaurant and was that safe? Well, yep, that, that seemed to be okay too, right? So I'm constantly receiving these kinds of signals about whether or not this thing is dangerous or not. Mm -hmm. And so as we sort of ramp up the number of things that we're doing outside of whatever we were doing beforehand, um, we're getting signals that says, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm using that in my updating process, which then eventually leads me to, to engage in potentially riskier and riskier, riskier and riskier behavior. Yeah, so if, if, you, if you're in a setting where <laughs> there's absolutely nothing at all that, I mean, it, it just simply looks like it's, it's pretty safe and everything is fine, then yeah, that, that, that should affect your belief system about sort of what the dangers are. And then as a response to that, what you should be doing to potentially protect yourself or, or others or, yeah. Yeah, that, it's fascinating to me that we can all respond to the same situation. We're all experiencing the same global pandemic, but we're all experiencing it differently and it's affecting us differently as individuals. So it's, your research is very interesting in terms of how we're reacting to this crazy time. Um, I, so I also wanna talk a little bit about, um, I know you've been working hard to take advantage of this, hopefully <laughs> once in a lifetime opportunity to sub study a global pandemic um, during the event itself. But can you tell me a little bit about what we should expect from here? Um, when the pandemic ends, will your research change? Will you continue to study it? Will studying it be different? Talk to me a little bit about what, what you see in terms of the future once this thing is really over. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, I mean, I, I think um, hopefully <clears throat> the idea of economics is that we have this very, we have this very general framework that is not necessarily event specific, but we're really just trying to understand human behavior in general, right? And so we were working on a couple of projects that weren't related to the pandemic, but rather how individuals process information or how individuals do different things. Um, and then the pandemic hit and, um, you know, it, 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 it felt somewhat like we, um, we owed it potentially to society to try and find something good out of this whole thing. Um, um, and so, I, 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 I mean, I mean, in addition to that, there's this this pandemic just causes, um, um, or or it it sort of it presents a, a nice natural experiment in in a sense that it's something that we don't actually get to observe very often. We don't get this from a social science perspective. We don't get these kinds of random shocks that just simply come along out of nowhere. Uh, we're still studying results. We're still studying data from World War II, for instance, trying to understand what happened there because, I mean, we just, we really don't get these kinds of shocks. And so um, whenever the, the pandemic hit, it was just seven days a week, 11, 12 hours a day, trying to gather data, trying to gather data. It's slowed down a little bit now. You can, maybe you can tell I'm a little, my a little bags under my eyes, a little tired still, but but yeah, I mean, we were really trying to gather as much information, as much data as possible, because we think that, 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 that the data that we're gathering now 
is um, going to be so useful, not just now, but for, for decades, not to understand the pandemic, but rather to just understand human behavior. Um, and, and so I think, you know, if, if I were thinking about sort of how this whole experience has, has sort of shifted or, or changed my research, I think probably what has happened is I've learned more about human behavior. It, it, I, don't, I don't know that it would, I, I would say it sort of shifted my research agenda um, per se, but it's allowed me to understand more about human behavior than potentially I would have had the chance to otherwise. Or maybe prior to this, it would have taken me 10 to 15 years of trying to get through a lot of other kinds of, um, of, of, of data to, to try and um, really get at the same concepts that I was getting at with, with the pandemic. And, and I think that that's probably true for decades from now, we're gonna be, as social scientists, we're really gonna be looking at this data to try and understand um, how human behavior, what humans do, why they do it. And, and for me, my, I, I suspect, right, that all of these insights that we've sort of learned um, so far, and, and, and the studies that we have are ongoing now too. Um, we still have studies that we're conducting. And I mean, specifically, we're, we're, we wanna try and understand too, what happens as people become now employed again, right? So, so now we have the now we have the opposite. So before, you know, they were unemployed. Now, now they're employed again. And so now we're trying to understand um, sort of employment and and how does becoming employed. And one study that we're looking at, for instance, is really thinking uh, about does does the unemployment or employment change somebody's empathy, um, where empathy is, of course, another one of those weirdo <laughs> kind of behavioral components that economists maybe aren't normally that's um, 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 tasked with, with studying. But I, I think it's an important component to a lot of economic activity. And, and so in this case, we're, we're really trying to understand that. And, and I think that those kinds of things that we're looking at is probably going to change uh, the trajectory of where my research career is going to go. Yeah. Wow, I'm exhausted listening, just thinking about all the things you have to research. It's crazy during this time that at, things are shifting so quickly, at, just as just as regular people out in the world not researching it. I mean, I I remember feeling like everything was shifting so quickly, and there was always new information coming out. And you've just been adapting the entire time to make sure you're capturing it. That's feels like a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so now that we've talked a little bit about the future of your research and how you see this kind of moving forward for yourself, I'd love to hear a little bit about the future for our students. So I know that we were supposed to have one of your students join us today, and he was unfortunately unable to at the last minute. Um, but can you talk a little bit to us about what it's like leading students, uh, managing your own research, and then instilling that importance of setting this unprecedented event in your students? Yeah, sure. So. Um... I'm I'm um, the thesis advisor for for uh, a, a student now, and he's finishing or he's working. He's not finished. He hasn't finished yet, but he's working on his thesis. And so the way I approach um, the way I approach helping students in these kinds of theses environments is what I like to do is I like to um, have them try and address or tr have them try and answer a research question that I don't think has been adequately answered yet. And so the way I like the way I like my students to research is 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 to try and figure out a way for them to find enjoyment in 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 the process itself. And the, so what drives me is um, this process of discovery, right? There, there's there's something that it's you know kind of like seeing being the first person to step foot on land that nobody has ever stepped foot on, or the first person on the moon, or something like this. I mean, there there is just something. I don't know, an explorer mentality. I'm not sure what it is, but there is just something about discovering something that nobody else has discovered um, that is incredibly rewarding. And so I, I want to try and figure out a way for my students to experience that as well, to, to have them try and, try and you know, go through this very long and tedious process of, of developing a research question um, and you know, going through the process. So what is the research question? Then how can I answer that research question? going through this one year, one and a half year, two year process, but to then in the end, hopefully to discover something that, um, that maybe nobody else has known before, or at least adding to knowledge in some way that we, we didn't know before. And so uh, one of the students, um, um, Casey, that I'm, that I'm working with on his thesis, what he wanted to know is why do people give to public goods? 
And so, <clears throat> in general, so, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll do an econ class for a minute. So public good, so what is a public good? So public good is um, a good in which an individuals can contribute to it, but it has usually a benefit to a lot of other people and you can't exclude anybody from this benefit. So public parks are a really good example of a public good, right? So usually um, a public park is provided for the public and everybody has some enjoyment out of that public park. Um, and you usually don't exclude people from the public park. National defense is another example, right? Usually um, national defense. So um, if, if for whatever reason I avoided pay, paying taxes and I didn't give to the government till to provide national defense, um, the government wouldn't say, okay, Glenn, your house is going to be excluded. If somebody sends nuclear missiles over, they're, we're gonna allow them to hit your house, but your neighbors are gonna be fine. No, I mean, usually you can't exclude somebody. And so the big question is, of course, why do people give to these public goods? If you're walking on the hiking trails and you see a piece of trash, picking it up, right, right, you, if you pick it up, it helps everybody, but then you gotta carry that piece of trash back for maybe three or four miles. And so the question is, why do people, why do people do that? Why do people pick up the piece of trash? Whenever other people are going to benefit from it, probably more than what it actually takes you um, to <laughs> carry that piece of trash back. Um, and so you can think, right, this also applies, a lot of my work is dealing with um, personnel economics, which is um, also thinking about how individuals contribute to team projects or groups. So thinking about at work. So there's always, almost always these free riders, right, that are taking advantage of everybody else's work. And so, but in general, the question is sort of, why do people give to public goods? There's a lot of real world examples of public goods. And so um, somewhat surprisingly, it's tough to figure out that exact motive. We know quite a bit about it but there's still a lot that, that, that we don't know. And so, and so that's what Casey was really trying to work on, was trying to understand the core motives for why people are giving to these things. Um, I mean, if we wanna think about, the old debate back in the 90s was, was that nobody would ever give to them. And, 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 and if nobody ever gives to them, but we think that they're actually beneficial to society in some way, and economic activity is enhanced and all of these things. Um, if nobody's gonna to give to them, but they're beneficial for society, that's a role for government to play. And so um, the debate was, well, maybe this is a role the government plays. But what they found was that, no, actually people do it on their own. People, even in these instances where it, it doesn't benefit them personally as much as we think it, 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 it should or, um, or relative to the group, people are still giving to these things. And so then we, we sort of explore, well, why do they give? Um, and so that's, that's what Casey is really trying to work on is, is trying to understand, as, is trying to understand the, that aspect of it. And then the pandemic did. And so we said, okay, Casey, um, I think that there's some public good components here that we can kind of think about. Um, we know, for instance, that um, a lot of the kind of behavior that we engage in um, to stop the spread of the pandemic helps me, helps everybody individually. Wearing a mask helps me from, from, from from catching COVID, but more than helping me, it usually the, the evidence seems to suggest it helps other people not catch it. If I, for instance, have COVID and I sneeze or I cough or I, you know, the water droplets somehow escape, if I have a mask, they're less likely to catch it. So a lot of the benefits from doing things like wearing a mask are supposedly going to be from other people not catching it. And so we would say that this is, this is in essence a public good. What I'm doing by wearing a mask is it's helping me a little bit, but really it's helping all of society more so that we don't spread this thing. And so what we've started doing now with Casey is we, we're, we're, we're trying to understand specifically college students mask wearing behavior and whether or not we can think about, um, whether or not we can think about um, the, the, the application there of, of, of trying to understand why people do or do not contribute to this, this public good of, of, of mask wearing, and can we think about potential policies that might be used to sort of address that, and maybe even at Ohio University, but I don't know that we'll actually get to, to hopefully the pandemic is resolved by the time Casey's done with his thesis, so I don't know that we'll, we'll have um, direct policy advice for OU, but yeah. I certainly hope so. Yeah, <laughs> I hope <yeah>. so. <laughs> um, okay, thank you so much for that. Um, we do want to go to our chat section. It looks like we do have a question um, from Gail Hawks. She says, if an unemployed person feels safe going to get groceries and going to restaurants, etc., how do they disbelieve science about the potent dangers of this pandemic? 
Ah, so yeah, so yeah, so I think I, I think so if if they feel safe, um, yeah, that's right. So if they feel safe going out and doing all of these things and not wearing a mask or or doing if if they feel safe doing these things, um, that sort of the the question is why do they feel safe doing those these things? And so they're feeling safe and and doing those kinds of things that we might think is risky is directly tied to their beliefs about the dangers of it. So if they believe that it's not dangerous. If they believe that it's not dangerous, then they're more likely to do those things. Why do they believe it's not dangerous? And so I think the fundamental question is, why might they ignore science, right? So why might they ignore science? Well, they have a motivated reason to believe that, the, that, that COVID isn't actually as dangerous as the scientists are saying it is. And so if, if you say, <laughs> I, I wouldn't suggest that you do this, but if you go online and you look at conspiracy theories for COVID, they are all over the place. And so if you wanted to support a belief that the COVID pandemic isn't as dangerous as, as what scientists are saying it is, you can find that. You can find information that supports that belief. There's all kinds of conspiracy theories out there that says that there is something else, right? There's, um, um, there's some secret organization that's um, dictating everything um, um, and that the secret organization is actually making it more, or, or is, is just making the claim that it's more dangerous somehow. <clears throat> And so, and so the, the question is sort of what kinds of information am I going to trust and why am I going to trust different kinds of information? Why would I discount, why would I discount information coming from a scientist and put more weight coming from some, some random website that has some, some wacky conspiracy theory on, 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 on whatever this thing is? Well, it, it, you know, in our view, sort of what we're finding is it probably comes down to a motivated reason to have that belief. So why am I going to put more Why am I going to put more um, weight onto the information that's coming from that website? Because I really want a job again. I want this thing not to be dangerous. Because if this thing isn't dangerous, then I can, I, you know, our economy can restart again. I can get a job. And so I think that right. So, so sort of thinking about <clears throat> thinking about it as as a general reason um, why people do what they do. Why do they form beliefs? Then, <laughs> as in the class, we have to think about well, what is their incentive to form that belief? Is there a motivated incentive for them to hold an alternative belief? And if there's a motivated reason for them to hold an alternative belief about something, then, then we think, well, then they probably do. Um, they're probably gonna figure out a way to justify that belief. Yeah, thanks, that was, that was a good question. So and that brought up an interesting question for me as well um, from Gail's question. And I don't know if this is your area of expertise or if this even makes sense in terms of how you study this, but where do motivated beliefs and reality collide? So if you're an unemployed person and you feel like um, COVID is not as big of a deal as it may actually be based on science because you have this motivated belief to be able to get a job and to be able to move forward with your life, what, what happens when in your head, you still feel like it's probably safer to wear a mask in the grocery store, or it's probably safer to not go to that big gathering, even though you really want, even though you have that motivated belief that it shouldn't be that big of a deal because you have this goal. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I think, let, let me make sure, so I'll restate your question. So I think what you're saying is, when can I switch over from believing that it's not dangerous to it's dangerous, or vice versa, right? Uh, switch over from thinking that this, this is not a dangerous thing, so let's say that I'm unemployed, then how can I think about that switchover point to me all of a sudden saying, okay, I do think it's dangerous, right? Yeah, so, so let's, think about, let's think about all of the signals that I'm receiving. So all of the signals that I'm receiving that this thing is dangerous. What this essentially means is that if I have a motivated reason to believe that it's not dangerous, I need a lot more signals of this thing being dangerous before I'm going to change my behavior than a person who does not have that motivated belief. So at what point is it switching over? I don't know, but it's gonna be more, right? So maybe what it takes, this person, maybe, maybe they actually get it. Maybe they actually get COVID-19 or maybe, maybe you know, a close family member gets COVID-19. Or maybe at some point, the evidence is just simply so overwhelming that they can't ignore it anymore. They, they simply have to say, okay, yep, it looks like if, you know, if people are wearing masks, then all, all, all around, if everybody's wearing masks or whatever, then, then the thing is, is not going to spread. And it looks like the death rate of this thing is, is higher than maybe I initially thought. And so, okay, maybe it, is, maybe it is more dangerous. But the amount of evidence that it takes to overturn whatever behavior someone's engaging in is so much higher for somebody ha who has these motivated beliefs. And so what is the exact switching point? Uh, it depends on the person. It depends on what their, 
what their motivated belief is and how strongly um, how strong that motivation is to hold that belief. But yeah, yeah, it just simply takes more evidence. So so maybe eventually they believe the scientists. So if if these external signals are how we sort of develop these motivated beliefs or how or how they impact our motivated belief, then what how do you give me your kind of take on people who like for instance in my family we know my family as a whole we know two different people who had covid one had no symptoms at all he only got tested because someone he worked with had it he was totally fine the other one was probably healthier than the first one and ended up on a ventilator and nearly died so in my opinion if i had only heard about that first person it may have motivated me to think okay, this really isn't that dangerous. People are getting it and they're just fine. Whereas if I had only heard about the second person, I would have had a very different thought process in my mind. Do you think that people experiencing this in such different ways impacts their belief system? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean, you're absolutely right. So one of the things that we asked also in these surveys was, um, do you know somebody who has been affected by COVID? And then thereafter, right, you know, do you know somebody, and then what are your beliefs about the dangers of COVID to you, your community, to the, to, to um, we asked several ones, to you, the community, the world, maybe, maybe the, the US and then the world. But, but yeah, there was a positive correlation here. Those people who had some kind of experience with, with one, of their, one of their friends or family members being um, infected by COVID or suffering something, even, even the, no, it was it was always the symptomatic cases, right? So if there was, yeah, um, then yeah, they 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 had a belief that this was more dangerous, and so we would say in that case, so exactly what you're saying, if you if you receive a signal um, that the individual has COVID but they're asymptomatic, um, then they would say, well, maybe it's not that dangerous, and we would say, well, that's maybe what they should believe, right? If that's the only signals that they're receiving, then they would say, yep, maybe maybe that's maybe that's fine. But if I have a motivated belief to to hopefully th to, to think that COVID might not be as dangerous and I receive both of those signals. One is asymptomatic and the other one is on a ventilator. And I want to believe that COVID isn't dangerous. I'm going to put a lot more weight onto the signal that I receive that the individual is asymptomatic. But all else equal, if I don't have a motivated reason, then I should take all of these signals and I should treat them all equally in a sense, right? And sort of update whatever my belief is based on that. Do you think anybody any of us in the world don't have some version of motivated belief about the pandemic? Do, are any of us approaching it that way, where we're saying, okay, we've seen both of these scenarios, they both hold equal weight? Or do we all have some, is something, even if it's small, motivating us one way or the other? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so um, I'm at home a lot now. <laughs> I'm always at home. And uh, one thing I did a long time ago was I learned how to make sourdough bread. It was kind of a fun thing because as an economist, that's like you're making something out of almost nothing, right? Like I don't need yeast. I just have some flour and water and a little bit of salt and I can make this bread. It's beautiful and it tastes good. And so as an economist, I really like this sort of making more out of the thing than, than sort of what, into, what went into it. So the pandemic hits and I start making a lot of sourdough bread because, well, yeast is in short supply. And <laughs> flour eh, a little iffy too but but right I, you know i started making a lot of sourdough bread i started doing a lot of things and i thought oh this isn't so bad you know it, it's okay but then after a while i'm like man i'm sick of sourdough bread <laughs> I, I could have something else or boy my kids are around all the time and i love them to death and my wife too but sometimes we just need a little bit of a break right and so at some point i was like mm, maybe it's not as bad as right maybe i would be maybe i don't need to do as many things maybe i can go outside a little bit more um and so absolutely no i think i mean i think i think there is a reason potentially for i mean even me i know i know this stuff i know i know that <laughs> i might have a motivated belief and i should i should i should try and ignore those sort of bad symptoms but yeah i think that's right i mean I mean, I, th I think that I think that even 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 the researcher started thinking, well, maybe maybe I should maybe I can start doing some of those things that I that I sort of really missed doing before. Going into a grocery store, maybe maybe it's okay. Maybe I can actually walk in a grocery store now. Oh, we could go down so many rabbit holes with this, but that <laughs> it was just making me think too. Uh, as parents, I love I love my daughter. She's three years old, and some days I'm like she needs to go somewhere else and do something. <laughs> so I'm sure 
parents especially are having interesting conversations about um, their motivations in terms of whether or not they want their children to be physically in school. Maybe it's a better learning environment, but it's not as safe. Whereas the online learning environment is maybe not as good of a learning environment, but is safer to them. So I think we're probably all seeing that differently too. So um, I don't, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole right now. We do have another question. Um, how can a policymaker take all of these individual cases in and form um, a policy that covers a large population of varied views. So I, it's definitely a harder, I, I yeah. can't imagine being in that role right now. Yeah. <laughs> From your point of view, how do you see that? Yeah, yeah. So um, if, if, we, if we have some general, so, so first of all, let, let's step back for it. Like, so economists are, really, economists are really bad at sort of making policy advice. I think that we shouldn't do that, right? <laughs> because I think that what, eco what economists do really well is we sort of show you the trade-offs, right? We show you sort of, um, here is how someone behaves in this scenario, and here is how someone behaves in this scenario. And we'll leave it up to other people, I don't know, political scientists or somebody else, to decide which one of those which one of those things are is, is more important and, and sort of what policy we should we should we should we should make based on these things. So so econ all econ so I would say economists' role really in this case is is really just trying to uncover what what trade-offs exist or how humans actually how how humans actually behave. And I think sometimes we get into trouble by by suggesting policy advice. Um, but I, my view is that we shouldn't. My view is that. All, we, all we're essentially doing is just simply laying out how humans behave and letting policymakers do with it what they will. Um, okay, but if I if I if I want to step outside of my role as an economist for just a moment and say what what do I think a policymaker might find useful or or, or interesting in in some of these kinds of things? And um, I think the I think the eventual goal is is to in the motivated beliefs example specifically, right? Just to think is there a reason why I think that people might be motivated to believe something is different and if, if I think that that's true, so for instance, let's just take our unemployment example. If I think that that's true, then maybe what I need to do is not target the general population for all of these ads or all of these different kinds of things, right? We saw that at some point, um, the government was gonna send out face masks. I mean, just millions and millions of face masks to, to, the, to the population. Maybe that's not actually um, the best use of my funds. Maybe what I need to do is think about those instances where people might have a motivated belief, a belief to um, hold something different, and that different belief, if that different belief has some kind of negative consequences on the public, maybe that's where my resources should be directed, right? So maybe what I should be doing is thinking about how I can, how, what kinds of information I need to show those, kind, those, those people who have lost their job, for instance, um, 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 so that, so that wh whatever resources that, right, the public, the public till, our tax dollars are better spent on sort of limiting the spread of this thing. Um, and so, so the general, the general takeaway, so fine, we've, we've shown one example of a motivated belief that, that might influence how people behave. But in general, you could think of, a, of, of other potential reasons why people might also have a motivated belief and why we might need to sort of direct our resources towards them. Um, parents going through all of the Zoom meetings and stuff right now with their kids, definitely one of those kinds of instances, right? Where we think that, right, any, anything like this where, man, I'm just tired of this thing. Um, maybe that's where, right, maybe, maybe a better approach to sort of spending our limited policy resource dollars is sort of thinking about where people might be motivated to hold a belief that is counter to what, what, what might be the true underlying probability from, from scientists' point of view. Um, and, and yeah, and, and directing those policy dollars. But I, I wanna, <laughs> I don't wanna, I wanna make a policy recommendation here, <laughs> but, but potentially that's how a policymaker could use that. Interesting, and yeah, I, I'm not even going to go anywhere near a policy recommendation, but I would certainly not want to be a policy maker right now. Um, oh. Way too much, way too much going on. Um, okay, so we're running a little low on time, but I do want to ask you one more question. Um, I know that your work prior to the pandemic is now also right back in the spotlight. So um, I want to talk a little bit about that. I know you've studied the effectiveness of remote work. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that research and how it applies now that the vast majority of us are in some version of a work from home, even if it's part-time lifestyle? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so um, yeah, so we started, yeah, we started talking. So yeah, one of the first papers that I did, this was in my third year in grad school, I started thinking a little bit about, about this, um, this idea of telecommuters being more or less productive. And 
what, you know, what I noticed at the time was all of the studies at that point, so going back to sort of some, some potential biases and survey responses and how I can think about survey responses, um, what I had noticed was that all of the surveys said telecommuters were more productive. And I thought, that makes absolutely no sense. In my, in my economic head, there's better outside options at home than there is in the office. There's, there's monitoring in the office. How in the world can it be that people that are working outside of the office are consistently more productive, working more hours, all of these, all of these other kinds of things? And immediately I thought, well, maybe there's a selection effect, right? Maybe those people who are harder working, who are more likely to work more hours, are the ones that the bosses or the managers would actually allow to telecommute. And that's what they're really picking up on. And so I thought, okay, well, how can I get rid of selection effects? I'm just going to do an experiment. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of all of these other kinds of effects. And I'm just going to simply ask people to perform some tasks in, in, an, in a cubicle. So I, have a, I had a lab. There was a cubicle that they, would, they, they went into and they, they did their tasks. And then I had also some people do it wherever they wanted to. So it was, it was, it was based on the internet. So they could do it in their, in, their, in their home. They could do it in the library. They could do it. Some did it at a coffee shop, a park. I didn't care. Um, and, and so what I, what I also thought was important was that probably a lot of, of telecommuters, people who are working remotely, are either, are, are either doing um, some kind of boring work or they're doing something a little bit creative. And so the boring work, right, like filling out the expense reports. I always think about office space where he, has, he always has to go in. He's always filling out like, like, did you get your expense report filled out? Uh, like that's the boring stuff, right? We have to do boring stuff. But there's also probably some amount of work that the, the, the remote workers are doing that's a little bit creative. Um, initially, I didn't, I didn't actually think there would be a difference. I thought, I don't care. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna prove once and for all that all of, all of these other studies are garbage and that, um, that this, this study is going to show that remote workers are just simply less productive because the environment makes them less productive. And so I did my study and I found, yep, absolutely. For that boring task, um, those people that were in the office cubicle-like environment were more productive. Um, those people outside of the cubicle-like environment were less productive, something like 15% less productive. They were producing less. Um, but, but on the creative task, I found the, the opposite. Those people who were, in, who were in the remote setting were actually, produ were, they were more productive on this creative task than those people who were in, the, who were in that cubicle office environment. And so this caught me a little bit by surprise um, I, I really, I, I truly expected for them to always be less productive in that remote setting. Um, so then I started thinking, all right, so, so you get some weird result like that. And, and then it sort of dictates sort of a lot of other, you're like, oh, why? What, what is different about creativity? And so now I've got, I don't know how many projects that are, that are, that are really trying to think about, well, what is, what is creative production? What, is, what do I think creative production looks like? And so we've got some stuff looking at that, but then also what, you know, so we did that study and that one, I don't know, people seem to like that one. And so I always get interview requests uh, for, um, for, for talking about that paper. But then um, another paper that, that I, that's also finished that Krista Jabsarol and I worked on is thinking about remote teams versus office teams. And, and what do I think um, is going to drive productivity when, whenever you're in kind of a team-based setting and specifically, Whenever I'm in an office and my my coworkers, my teammates are in sort of a remote setting, and so going on off of those belief stories again that we already talked about, the idea is: Do I believe that those people outside of outside of my office setting, do I believe that they're going to be less productive? And if I hold that belief, then am I going to also reduce my productivity? Because I don't want to be taken advantage of. If I'm in a team, I don't want everybody else to take advantage of me, and so I might because if I think that they're watching TV, walking their dog, having all kinds of fun, and I'm in the office just working away, then maybe I'm also going to reduce my, 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 my own input into this team. And so we wanted to do that. We, so we did the same thing. We, we put some people in sort of a cubicle-like setting, some people outside, and we mixed up the teams that, you know, that sort of the location of their teammates, you know, who they were, who they were working with. Were they, were they all in the office? Were they all outside the office or you know some mix of this and and we found that that once again that this matters that um, beliefs matter that those people who were in the office but believed that their telecommuters were, were shirking somehow were less productive also contributed less um, to their to their to their own team output but the nice thing about this is that um, that those people that were outside of the office the remote workers felt so guilty they really didn't want to be the one that was the low guy. And so they contributed more to the team than all of the office space guys. 
And so it ended up, it didn't, it didn't actually, it didn't actually turn out to be that bad of a scenario. It's just the beliefs. And so, and so it wasn't the actual team production of the telecommuters. It was the beliefs of the office space people that was driving the whole result. And, and so, and what's nice there is that, well, we can fix beliefs. All I have to do is just show you that, hey, everybody outside of the office is equally productive. They're, they're working hard too. And once you fix those beliefs, then we sort of get rid of the, 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 the potential problems that we might run into. Wow, that, that's so interesting. I hadn't thought about the team environment, but many of us are working on teams in this environment and it's definitely a different dynamic, but it, it seems, I mean, at least for our team, it seems to be going really well. So I, that's really interesting. I'm, I hadn't heard much about that before. So thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we are pretty much out of time. I, this conversation has been so wonderful and I really appreciate your time and your willingness to discuss your research with us. Uh, we look forward to hearing more about your work in the future. I know you're still, still studying the pandemic and have lots more going on. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and thank you so much to the audience who joined us today. If you have any additional questions for Dr. Dutcher, please feel free to respond to your email registration and we can um, reach out to you and try to try to get those answered for you. So thank you all so much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your evening and keep an eye out for more Ohio at Home series events coming up.